Hi everybody. I don't know if my microphone is working or not, but we'll see. Hopefully this will work out. <laughs> Hi, how's everybody doing? Last time we were reading from this book, the Citizen's Rule Book, and I figured I'd go into part two. Uh, this is a really great little reading book, especially for like homeschoolers or children. It's very easy to understand. It um, has a lot of the congressional rulings and um, Supreme Court rulings that make these things true. Um, I'm going to read a few quotes to get us started because these are really good. The jury has a right to judge both the law as well as the fact and controversy. John Jay, First Chief Justice, U.S. Supreme Court, 1789. The jury has the right to determine both the law and the facts. Samuel Chase, U.S. Supreme Court Justice, 1796. <clears throat> the law itself is on trial quite as much as the cause which is to be decided. Harlan F. Stone, 12th Chief Justice, U.S. Supreme Court, 1941. So we go on to the second part. This is called the law of the land. The general misconception is that any statute passed by legislators bearing the appearance of law constitutes the law of the land. The U.S. Constitution is the supreme law of the land. In any statute, to be valid must be in agreement. It is impossible for a law which violates the Constitution to be valid. This is succinctly stated as follows. All laws which are repugnant to the Constitution are null and void. That's Marbury versus Madison. Uh, in 1803. Where rights secured by the Constitution are involved, there can be no rulemaking or legislation which would abrogate them. That's Miranda versus Arizona. <clears throat> Doesn't say what year that is. <laughs> An unconstitutional act is not law. It confers no rights. It imposes no duties. Affords no protection. It creates no office. It is in legal contemplation, as inoperative as though it had never been passed. That's Norton versus Shelby County. <clears throat> okay, and then it has a summary of the Ten Commandments here. We'll just go over that because this is the reason why we have a justice system. Is because there is objective moral law. And if you're a moral relativist, just get out of here. There is objective morality. We all know this, even killers, even criminals, we know that it's wrong. But we choose to do it anyway. This is free will. <clears throat> so the Ten Commandments represent God's government over man. God commands us for our own good to give up wrongs and not rights. His system always results in liberty and freedom. The Constitution and the Bill of Rights are built on this foundation, which provides for punitive justice. It is not until one damages another person or property that he can be punished. The Marxist or communist system leads to bondage, and God's system leads to liberty. And then it lists the Ten Commandments. Number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Number two, thou shalt not make any, make unto thee any graven image. Those are both pretty much the same. No idol worship. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. That's the only commandment that's not mentioned in the New Testament. Jesus is the Sabbath. Honor thy father and mother. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Directly above the Chief Justice's chair is a tablet signifying the Ten Commandments. When the Speaker of the House in the U.S. Congress looks up, his eyes look into the face of Moses. The Bible is the book upon which this republic rests. That's a quote by Andrew Jackson, the seventh president. <coughs> Now, here's the summary of the Communist Manifesto. 
The Communist Manifesto represents a misguided philosophy which teaches the citizens to give up their rights for the sake of the common good. It always ends in a police state. This is called preventative justice. Control is the key concept. And then it has the tenets here. Number one, abolition of private property. Number two, heavy progressive income tax. Number three, abolition of all rights of inheritance. Number four, confiscation of property of all immigrants and rebels. Number five, central banking. <clears throat> Number six, government control of communications and transportation. Number seven, government control and ownership of factories and agriculture. Number eight, government control of labor. Number nine, corporate farms, regional planning. And number 10, government control of education. Now you can do your homework. You can tick off those boxes. If you live here in the U.S., you know about where we are. <clears throat> so, to give up rights for the common good. What is that? <clears throat> Politicians, bureaucrats, and especially judges would have you believe that too much freedom will result in chaos. Therefore, we should gladly give up some of our rights for the good of the community. In other words, people acting in the name of government say we need more laws and more jurors to enforce these laws, even if we have to give up some rights in the process. Some believe the more laws we have, the more control, thus a better society. This theory may sound good on paper, and apparently many of our leaders think this way, as evidenced by the thousands of new laws that are added to the books each year in this country. <clears throat> but no matter how cleverly this Marxist argument is made, the hard fact is that wherever, whenever you give up a right, you lose a free choice. This adds another control. Control's real name is bondage, as we spoke about in the former episode. I'll link somewhere up top. <clears throat> the logical conclusion would be, if giving up some rights produces a better society, then by giving up all rights, we could produce the perfect society. Utopia, right? <clears throat> we could chain everybody to a tree for lack of trust. This may prevent a crime, but it would destroy privacy, which is the heartbeat of freedom. It would also destroy trust, which is the foundation of dignity. Rather than giving up rights, we should be giving up wrongs. The opposite of control is not chaos, more laws do not make less criminals. We must give up wrongs, not rights, for a better society. <clears throat> William Pitt of the British House of Commons once proclaimed, Necessity is the plea for every infringement of human liberty. It is the argument of tyrants. It is the creed of slaves. So we must, we must have all these laws. Well, no, we really only need ten. So my battery's low. I just wanted to do a short episode. I hope this finds you well and you're having a great day wherever you are.